There are Americans who every night in this country go to bed hungry. They go to bed homeless. They go to bed without adequate medical care. They are going through a crisis because no one supports them. You know, the United States is, is it's, its cruelty to its citizens is a reflection of its cruelty to the world. So when, when we see the amount of mass shootings that happen in the United States, I think it's a reflection of America's militarism and its violence. Um, I've said this before, and I think Chomsky has said this too, but like the United States is the most violent nation on earth, like bar none. Um, and it will always be the most violent nation on earth because we've been the only country on earth to ever drop an atomic bomb on people. We became the most violent country on yeah. earth in 1945, and yeah. we've been that ever since. And it's been at the expense of our democracy. It's been at the expense of our human rights. It's been at the expense of our democratic liberties. It's been at the expense of decency. Hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist uh, perspective. Uh, I'm joined by Justin Clark. Hi, Thanks Corey. How are you? Yeah. Good. How about you? I'm fine. Fine. Thanks. It's pretty cold in here in the old Indiana. It's been or, single digits. And are you guys hit, getting the polar vortex too? Oh, you better believe it, buddy. It's I bet you it's worse for you, but uh, yeah, no, it's pretty bad. Minus 46 in some places in Saskatchewan, 46 Celsius, which is, oh, I suppose, because uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius, they match at minus 40. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so. Wow. So it's, it's very, below. very cold. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's like, it's like seven degrees Fahrenheit here today. And it was, it was really, really cold. It's the, it's the messes with your tires weather, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I always hate Every that. day. Ugh, I hate, yeah, that's the most annoying thing. Please fill your air, <laughs> to, yeah, the air to the exactly, to the exactly. pressure. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. Um, I just did that four days ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, so it's been a, it's pretty, pretty, pretty wild week, you know, with politics. Obviously, you know, we're, we're recording this after the Iowa caucus. So Trump just won the Iowa caucus. You know, it feels like we're living in, in sort of really weird kind of dark times. And so what I want to do tonight is kind of talk about somebody who was actively writing and commenting on really another dark time in American history, which was about 20 years ago um, during the presidency of George W. Bush. Um, and so uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the wartime pamphlets of Gore Vidal. Um, hey. So for those of you who probably have figured out, not just by following me on social media, but also <laughs> following me in general, that Gore Vidal is my favorite author. Right. Um, you know, you know, outside of like Marxist stuff, right? He's my favorite author. And, um, you know, he was, a, he was a novelist. He was an essayist. He was a social critic. He was a politician. Um, he ran for elected office twice. Um, and he was someone who recognized the, the problems of American empire in only ways that somebody who came from the sort of elite could. So, you know, Vidal was born into a political family. You know, his, his grandfather was T.P. Gore, who was the senator from Oklahoma. His, his father, Eugene Luther Vidal, was a West Point graduate, master athlete, and um, and was the director of air commerce for FDR. Um, so he comes from a very deep political background and political family. Runs for Congress in 1960 um, alongside uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, who's running for president. Um, you know, uh, does very well, although doesn't win, um, but does quite well in the county he ran in in upstate New York. Runs for the Senate in 1982 in California. Um, doesn't win there, but does pretty well against Jerry Brown, who ended up winning the nomination, but lost the election to, um, I forget who ended up being the, re the Republican candidate who won that Senate election. But Vidal was always, um, you know, he was, he, he was born in 1925, died in 2012. Um, and, okay. uh, and um, he was somebody who came from a political world who knew and, and, and mingled with 
the people at the highest echelons of power. And he was somebody, I think a writer very similar to Bertrand Russell, who understood really what power is. Um, and, and really understands that like the, one of the central motivations of human humans is power. Um, you know, for, for Marx, everything is about money, you know, and with Freud, everything is about sex. Right. When in reality, all of those are just manifestations of something broader, which is power. Now Marx yeah. understood that, but like, but basically to a point. So, um, and so Vidal was somebody who wrote very, extensively and eloquently on the problems of the American empire and was very clear about it. Um, he was a veteran of the second world war. Um, so he comes from a background of, of, of not just being born into sort of political, uh, prominence, but also, um, experienced war firsthand. Um, okay. and, uh, and, you know, he lived in Latin America for a time and then he comes back to the United States in the 1940s. Um, he was openly, uh, a queer person, I think is probably what we would describe him as. Although okay. he, he always had a very like ambivalent relationship to describing himself as being gay. Um, you might describe him as being bisexual, which is probably really what he was. Okay. Um, but he was somebody who was very open about being, uh, you know, comfortable with homosexuality. And, you know, he once said that the, you know, the only, you know, the, the, the distinction between heterosexual, heterosexual and homosexual is the same distinction between someone who has blue eyes and someone who has green eyes. Um, and, uh, sounds about right. <laughs> and it sounds about right. Like it's, you know, he wrote a novel in 1948 called the city and the pillar, which was, um, probably the first American novel of real, um, prominence to, uh, sort of uh, address homosexuality like openly um, and uh, was absolutely merc like like mercilessly pilloried by the media establishment at the time. Um, the New York Times book critic said he wouldn't review his books ever again. And like, <laughs> so, so he sort of spent a, a decade in the wilderness writing television and screenplays and things like that. Um, I learned about Gore Vidal when I was in middle school, high school. So he was somebody who was on TV a lot during the age of the war on terror, you know, which ostensibly yeah. we guess we're still kind of in, but no one calls it that anymore. Right. Uh, and the, the early years of George W. Bush, the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. And as a young person, he was one of the people who I saw on television, you know, speaking sense about how, you know, the war in Iraq was wrong. It was based upon lies and its service was really only an empire that the goal of the United States was to basically control the Middle East um, for the purposes of extracting wealth and resources from it. And, uh, and I think that's true. Um, and he, he, uh, he, and when we call these pamphlets, they are small, small books, but they're okay. sort of pamphlets and sort of the tradition of Thomas Paine, the great revolutionary war era, um, uh, American pamphlet tier. So they're pretty taste. thick pamphlets. <laughs> They're, they're sort of thick ish. Like they're kind of like this thick, you know, there's like, you know, well, that's, that's but more than a pamphlet, I would say, but, <laughs> but there's three, there's three of them. And so we'll be talking about kind of all three together, you know? Okay. Um, so the first book came out in 2002 and that's perpetual war for perpetual peace. Um, okay. How we got to be so hated. He followed that up a year later with the second pamphlet, which is called dreaming war, um, blood for oil and the Cheney Bush junta. Mm -hmm. And the third book and the final book, which is Imperial America, Reflections on the United States of Amnesia. And uh, so these have both um, contemporary essays at the time, so things that he had written pretty much within that year or within a year of the publication of the book. Um, and then some of them were classic essays that he had written, you know, 20 or 30 years before, um, but still had resonances. Um, so... The first, the first thing is he sort of addresses in the first book, Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace, um, the, the, the attacks of September 11th. And very much like other people at the time, you know, people who um, I think rightly hit the nail on the head with this, whether it was, you know, Noam Chomsky or Michael Parenti's book, The Terrorist Trap or Terrorism Trap, um, I think – spoke eloquently to the problems of why we got into this in the first place. Um, and 
uh, so at the time there was sort of, you know, at the time there was sort of this sort of rah, rah, America can do no wrong. Everything is wonderful. You know, yeah. Bush had his highest presidential approval rating at that time ever. Um, there was a real sense of like, why would they do this to us? Why would they do this to us? They hate and us for our freedom. They hate us for our freedom. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> they hate us for our freedom. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's really, you know, that's really dangerous, um, a really dangerous notion. And he pretty much believes that too. Um, and, and sort of writes about how, you know, up to the September 11th attacks, there was a, you know, an, what he calls an unrelenting demonization of the Muslim world in the United right. States. The fact that the United States had been involved in so many foreign entanglements for decades. And in fact, a lot of people bought this book specifically because uh, a good chunk of the first book actually has like detailed notes of every U.S. intervention anywhere in the world wow. from basically, you know, 1999 or the 1990s, um, um, but through, you know, decades and decades of constant U.S. intervention all over the world, whether it be in Latin America, um, the Middle East and so forth and, and the casualties. Um, and Basically so, every yeah. friggin' Latin American country, every yeah. Middle Eastern country, every Middle Eastern country, <laughs> multiple, multiple African, African companies, countries. Yeah. Um, but talks with U S forces involved. He talks about, you know, so it's this, you know, it's this sort of very clear, you know, and it, and he goes all the way back to like 1949 and like the Berlin airlift and all of this. Wow. So, so he, he kind of shows how, you know, because, in Vidal's mind, and, and if you, you you read his essays and you get a sense of this, that you know, and 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 maybe he has a more sort of you know positive view of the United States than maybe say you and I would have, but like basically he sort of says that you know pre World War II, the United States did get involved in multiple countries, but in general, it its its imperial sort of ambitions were rather minor compared to what it was trying to do domestically. This all changes with the Second World War mainly for a couple of reasons. One was that after World War II, uh, there were there was the possibility of a serious recession, um, that if all of that wartime production and employment was going to go, it was going to end, that we were going to sort of scale back our military and have things go back to peacetime, that you'd have all of these you know, hundreds of thousands of American soldiers coming back home with to no jobs and no prospects. Right. So, so it's very, it's a very economic, very Marxist argument, which is like, okay, well, material, material conditions shape the future, shape the, shape the conditions in which we're in and shape decision making. And so, uh, when the, um, American government decided world war, post-world war II to not disarm, you know, after most major conflicts in American history, the, the United States sort of pared down its military. It didn't. You didn't keep large military, all the uh, large military uh, footprint all of the time. Right. And, uh, but post-World War II, it became a permanent war state, um, what he calls the national security state. And, uh, um, and he has a great essay called the national security state, which is in one of these books. I'm not sure which might be Imperial America, um, where he kind of lays out the history of this. That was instituted largely by president Harry Truman, um, and a lot of, uh, other people high up and involved with him, like, um, James Burns, um, who was his sort of designate secretary of, of, of state. And you have, you know, other leaders like George Kennan and Dean Acheson and all these guys who are sort of developing, um, what would be the permanent war economy. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other reason why we're doing all of this alongside keeping people employed is to fight communism. It's, it's specifically and explicitly an anti-communist crusade. So much of the United States' foreign interventions through the decades, well up until the end of the Cold War, were largely, were largely a, a, a sort of proxy war fact, you know, footing between us and the Soviet Union, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so that's what Vietnam is, what Korea was, you know, the, the, that was what, um, you know, us getting involved in Afghanistan. So, you know, like Vidal correctly right. points out about the Mujahideen, um, the, the sort of freedom fighters of Afghanistan that the United States supported through yep. through money. Um, you know, if people want to learn more about that, uh, there's a good movie about it called Charlie Wilson's War. You can check out um, about that, um, about a congressman who was deeply involved in all of that with the CIA. 
And of course, one of the people that we funded through the Muhajideen was Osama bin Laden. Yep. Um, you know, yep. there's an also another inconvenient fact, which uh, people did not want to talk about at the time, which was that in August of 2001, um, President Bush was gay, was given a national security briefing about Osama bin Laden's intentions to attack inside the United States. Now, bin Laden had attacked the United States before and in fact had attacked the World Trade Center specifically in 1993. So there was a World Trade Center bombing in 1993. The building was okay. Some people got hurt, but it was a very minor affair compared, of course, to 9-11. And so you see the bombing of, of embassies. You see a lot of the, the ramp up of the war on terror. A lot of it actually kind of starts with uh, Bill Clinton. A lot of people think of it as starting with George W. Bush, and, and it, in a lot of ways it does. But a lot of it actually starts with Bill Clinton. Um, and and uh, it's in, in many ways response to domestic terrorism. So a good chunk of the Perpetual War per, for Perpetual Peace book um, is about uh, Vidal's um, analysis of Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma okay. City bombing in 1995. Um, so for those of you who don't know, pre-9-11, the, the single largest terrorist attack in the United States was in Oklahoma City at the, uh, the um, Murrah Federal Building in, in Oklahoma City in 1995. Um, that was, for the most part, at least to the best of our knowledge, was mostly organized by Timothy McVeigh and another guy named Terry Nichols. Um, McVeigh was um, somebody who was a veteran of the Gulf War. Um, and in the Gulf War, he gets kind of disillusioned with us. He kind of basically learns what the American empire is. Um, he gets a sense of, oh, we're not going over there to like liberate these people. Like we're going over there to serve the interests of the, the, the capitalist class and the, the, um, the, the dreams of the architects of American empire. Right. And, uh, and so Vidal starts having a correspondence with him when he's in prison um, and, and, and he kind of, people would often think, well, what does Oklahoma city have to do with nine 11? And in many ways, um, I think, uh, I think part of it is, um, there's something he writes and I'm just going to share this, but he, he writes about this in Timothy, but he writes, um, once we meditate upon the unremitting violence of the United States against the rest of the world, while relying upon pretexts that, for sheer flimsiness, might have even given Hitler pause when justifying some of his most Baroque lies, one begins to understand why Osama struck at us from abroad in the name of one billion Muslims whom we have encouraged through our own preemptive acts of war, as well as relentless demonization of them through media, to regard, to regard us in, how shall I put it, less than an amiable light. And so he sees all of these things as being connected. Well, why did Timothy McVeigh attack the federal building in Oklahoma City? The reason, ostensibly, was because of the federal overreach during two specific instances in the early 90s. One is, the, one is Ruby Ridge and the other is Waco. So Ruby Ridge uh, was when the United States went in, uh, uh, U.S. forces went in to kind of stop what were these sort of right-wing militia people? But it yeah. kind of got out of hand. The more important one is Waco. So yeah. Waco, Texas, um, there was a cult called the Branch Davidians, which was led by a guy named David Koresh, who thought of himself as like the second coming of Jesus Christ. So like there's this, they're legitimate psychos. Like, don't get me wrong. They're not great people either. Right. But it, but it had been suspected that they had been, you know, harboring weapons, that they had a cache of weapons and um, that they had the the intent to become violent and maybe do acts of domestic terrorism. Although right. that was very – that was the public justification by the Justice Department and ATF, uh, the, Act, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. So the ATF and the Justice Department, the FBI, go in guns blazing at Waco, which leads mm -hmm. to um, – I think the deaths of like over 80 people, including kids. Um, and, uh, and it leads to Waco being burned down. So uh, McVeigh writes Vidal a lot about how he's like these instances of the United States using its power against its own citizens yeah. is what is, is what radicalized. It's sort of what galvanized me to do what I did. Now, again, 
what Timothy McVeigh did was horrible. I mean, he killed innocent people, you know, yeah. as did Osama bin Laden. These aren't people to like celebrate. No, it's like when I and when I see leftists to like celebrate Ted Kaczynski, like that's no, disgusting. You're doing, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. <laughs> um, but it's not. It's we're not justifying them. We're understanding them, and that yeah. was really the point that I think um, you know that he gets to. He talks about you know. He writes about in the in all of these books the sort of increased amount of surveillance that Americans have been under over the last 20, 30 years, which is true. I mean, you go in any major American city, there are cameras everywhere. Um, you know, they they can track you with your cell phone, they can track you with your credit card purchases, your ATM purchases, you know, whatever you do. Um, you know, we have the illusion of privacy in the United States. We don't really right. have real privacy anymore. Um and uh and as he actually writes about it, he says, you know, it has always been a mark of American freedom that unlike countries under constant Napoleonic surveillance, we are not obliged to carry identification to show to curious officials and pushy police. But now due to terrorism, every one of us has stopped at airports and obliged to show an ID that must include a mugshot, something as Allah knows no terrorist would d ever dare fake, which is kind of a joke because, you know, Muslims can't draw Muhammad. But um, but basically, yeah, I mean, we live in a surveillance state. We've lived in a permanent garrison state in the United States, essentially since the end of World War II. And we lived in a permanent surveillance state for at least at least my entire lifetime. Right. Um, and uh, and that's especially the case now. So one example of this is in the United States, you have to have something that's called a real ID. Um, and uh, and uh, I have one. So I have a, I technically have a real ID in it. And the way you know that it's a real ID is it has this little star on it in the corner. Okay. And in order to get into any federal building in the United States, you have to have a real ID. You can't get into one otherwise. Interesting. And so, uh, and so, yeah. So it's it's there's all these little ways in which your your rights of privacy, your rights of your person to keep your you know violations of the Fourth Amendment to the, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, unwarranted search and seizure. Um, we've also seen during, you know, as he writes in the books, you know, during the Bush years, especially you see the increase of, obviously you see the passage of the Patriot Act and the Patriot Act sort of puts all of this on steroids. There was a terrorist law that was passed, um, combating terrorism act that was passed during the Clinton era, um, that sort of started to give the federal government some more teeth, but right after 9-11, the Patriot Act was passed, which goes to show you that like, and it passed within weeks of the 9-11 attacks, you know, the sweeping, you know, curtailment of civil rights and civil yeah. liberties in the United States, all aimed at trying to combat terrorism, um, somehow sort of materialized within a matter of weeks, which goes to show you these people were cooking this up and they were looking for the justification to do it. Yeah. Um, and 9-11 was the justification that gave them everything. Um, and uh, as you can tell from the subtitle of the second, Bush, second book, The Blood for Oil and the Cheney Bush Junta, notice that Cheney's name is first. So um, Vidal bought into the idea that I believe in too, which is Cheney was the one who was really running the show, at least in the first term. So uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. We have a we have a couple comments uh, okay. from uh, Bemke watches Buffy. <laughs> um, That's a fun name. And uh, now some random geek and and Velkin are here too as well. Great. And we actually have a few people who have joined on Instagram but haven't commented. I'm not sure if they're okay, still here. Okay, great. But, okay, cool. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Bemke watches Buffy said, Michael Rupert has dozens of warnings of 9-11 with evidence referenced in his book, Crossing the Rubicon. Good point. I haven't heard of that book. The other book that people have, have pointed – two books people have also pointed to is The Looming Tower by uh, Lawrence Wright and uh, Ghost Wars by Steve Cole. Um, that those two books really lay out a lot of the U.S. foreign policy – um, that led up to 9-11, but I'll check that and, one out too. Thank you. And right now I'm actually listening to the blowback, uh, podcast, oh, yeah. season one, which is very good on, on this, on the whole war in Iraq <laughs> subject, which is also part of the 9-11 story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so regarding, uh, Ruby Ridge and, uh, Timothy McVeigh and, and Waco, uh, bo uh, like both victims of America as much as killer of citizens. Without a doubt. And that's actually Gore Vidal's point. Like that's, that's kind of the point is that he's saying that like these people are just as much a casualty of the American empire as, as anyone that they killed. 
yeah. um, especially McVeigh, because McVeigh was actually when he was imprisoned, he was imprisoned in my home state. He was he was imprisoned and executed in Terre Haute, Indiana in 2001. I remember the I remember it vividly I, as a kid. I remember the news right. that morning of watching him walk to the building where they would do it. And uh, yeah. And then regarding the uh, the legislation, uh, Bemke said introed within a day, right? Pretty much, yeah. And and a lot of it, and very little of it, actually. Like most of the people who voted for the Patriot didn't read it. I mean, I, they couldn't read it or at the very least they couldn't read it substantively. Like right. it was pretty much, it was rubber stamped as much as, as the um, authorization of use of military force, the, the AUMF, like that was pretty much given to Bush without pretty much any kind of, of um, criticism with the exception of um, I think Barbara Lee was like the only person in Congress. I, can't, I think it was her who voted against the war in Afghanistan right. and yeah, gave this I very impassioned that. speech where, you know, um, and, yeah. and of course, Bernie, when Bernie Sanders, when he was a congressman, uh, then became senator, was, was very much against the war in Iraq. Although I think he was okay with the war in Afghanistan, but, yeah. but he was definitely against the war in Iraq. Uh, Velkin 999 said, I have a driver's license, but not a real ID. I also work at a federal building. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Those laws might be different for different people, but that's always been the justification for why I, that you have to have real ideas that you're not allowed in the federal buildings otherwise, but, or maybe it's federal courthouses. Maybe it's like more specific, but, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting how that works. Um, you know, but yeah, I, it was one of those things where it's like, you have to have it. I was, I kept saying, well, you have to have it because of this thing, but it seems <laughs> to know that your experience is different. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, he also, they also said, unless it's a state specific thing. It so might maybe, be, maybe it could very well be. I'm not sure. That's at least what I was sort of informed upon and in living in the state of Indiana, but. And then but, um, yeah. is, is with us over on Twitch. So thank oh, you. Oh, wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so let's, you know, there was sort of this narrative, and this was very popular with liberals. Um, there was this narrative that um, that sort of uh, Afghanistan was the right war, and Iraq was like the the, the you know was the, was the was the war of choice. You right. know, it was the war of convenience. I don't think that's true. Um, neither did Vidal. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, why on earth did we invade Afghanistan when? The vast majority of, you know, the people who perpetrated 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden was from Saudi Arabia. The, the hijackers were Saudi. They were trained in the United well, States. We're not going to invade Saudi Arabia. No, <laughs> no, we're not. Because, you Come know, on. and I think, I think there's a good book about this. Uh, I think it's called like House of Bush, House of Saud okay. um, about this stuff. But, but yeah, like it's. The United States has had a dec I mean a decades, almost a century long involvement with Saudi Arabia, especially which starts to really come to fruition during the FDR years and then really kind of kind of picks up. Um, but you can make the argument that the more fundamentalists or radical iterations of Islam come from the 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 uh, the strains of Islam within Saudi Arabia. A lot of it is and so, you know, and Bin Laden himself came from an extremely wealthy family. Like um, the Bin Ladens were very wealthy and very well connected. Um, there's yeah. a fact, and I think it's in the Dreaming War book, but it's something that um, Michael Moore also makes a point of in his in his documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, that, uh, you know, when every plane was pretty much grounded in the United States, um, the federal government found a way to get the Bin Laden family out of the United States on a plane when all the other planes were landed. Interesting. It's curious. Um, you know, and I'm not one of those people who like Bush did 9-11. Like, I don't believe that. Neither did Vidal. What I'm saying is that there was so much evidence that the federal government had, whether it was at the FBI, the CIA, or in the White House, they knew something was going to happen. And they basically sat on their hands, which then makes you wonder, did they do that on purpose or not? Because it gave them, it gave them the, 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 the mandate to do what they wanted to do. Mm. which was to invade Iraq. I mean, if you look at the neoconservatives who were in power, you know, who came into power in the in, in the early 2000s in the Bush administration, all of them wanted to, to an invade Iraq at some point. You know, there had already been a no-fly zone again over Iraq instituted under the Clinton administration. There was already murmurings that things were already starting to fall apart. You know, we had had a very, United States had, has had, had a very, very love-hate relationship with Saudi, with um, Saddam Hussein, 
for right. a very, very long time. You know, so the United States was very cozy to him and supported him in the Iraq Iran Rumsfeld War. Rumsfeld visited him early. In Rumsfeld the- visited him. There's pictures <laughs> of them sh- smiling and shaking hands and shit. And um, it's very much like Gaddafi. Gaddafi is the same thing where like the United States, he's like, an, he's a foe. And then for a while he's a friend and then he goes back to being a foe. It's yeah. the same with Saddam. Um, so, you know, and so it, it it's clearly, in my opinion, at least the war in Iraq was, was really done for, in, in my opinion, kind of two reasons. One, I do think it's as simple as blood for oil. I really do. I think a lot of it was just pure economic self-interest and empire building. Um, We didn't go over there to liberate these people. Like, you know, the United States is humanitarian intervention. Like that stuff is a farce. Like most of the time, the United States leaves a wake of destruction behind it when it goes into other countries. You know, we don't often come in as liberators. We often are a pest. And, and, um, and so Iraq is a good example of that. I mean, Iraq is objectively in a worse state today. And so is Afghanistan than it was when we invaded that those places 20 years ago. So, um, so the war in Iraq uh, is sort of built upon the flimsy notions that these lies that the Bush administration had consistently told the American public, which is that he had weapons of mass destruction. There was no evidence of that. Yep. You know, I remember when Colin Powell went in front of the United Nations Security Council and showed the different. He had all these little examples and everything, and and showed all that he had. He had all here's all the. The evidence, the intelligence that we have to say that he has these weapons of mass destruction. The other thing that the administration did was it often um, sort of tied Saddam Hussein to Al Qaeda, who had perpet- who had perpetrated 9/11. Right. Yeah. There was no evidence to suggest that that was the case, and in and in, and in respect, some respects, they might have hated each other, depending on you yeah. know um, they had very different political orientations and religious orientations. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously that wasn't really true either. And so the United States falls back on the justification being, well, this is a war of humanitarian intervention. Saddam is the worst person since Hitler. We have to take him out. And this is the thing you, it's, it's, it's the rotating villain, you know, you know, there's always the rotating villain. You know, when I was growing up, it was Saddam Hussein. When it was the eighties, it was Gaddafi. When it was the seventies, it was the Ayatollah. When it was the sixties, it was the Soviets. Like there's always a rotating villain. You know, today it's Putin, right? And I'm not saying any of these people are good. I'm just saying that like the United States uses these rotating villains as a means to justify its empire building and continuance of the national security state and the permanent um, war economy the United States has been in since 1940. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that, uh, it's disastrous and it's horrible for the country. And, and so in dreaming war, but all lays out very clearly, a lot of the connections, the fact that, you know, um, that Dick Cheney ran a company called Halliburton, um, and Halliburton benefited greatly from the war in Iraq in terms of very cushy military contracts, um, to fulfill services that weren't necessarily serviced by, private companies before a lot of stuff is privatized during the war in Iraq. Yeah. Um, this is some, uh, I know, you know, this because I read a lot about this stuff in, in, um, in Naomi Klein's book, shock doctrine. Yeah. She writes about this. So does Vidal in dreaming war. Um, and so, uh, you know, yeah, it and- was a whole thing. Like, uh, cause Rumsfeld wanted to privatize the American military as yeah. well. Like, so that was part of his project was to, spread the money to all these freaking companies. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, that that's really the tricky part is, um, you know, and, and it's, and to me, it just seems that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were all pretty much a, an, about, you know, maintaining wealth and resources in the region. Um, so he, he, he writes about how, you know, a lot of it was, you know, done for, you know, the, the fact that the George W. Bush became sort of a player in the oil field, in the oil industry in the late 1970s. He has his own company that's called Arbusto um, and and um, and uh, was very connected with the Bin Laden family. So there's connections between the Bush family and Bin Laden family. It's part of the reason why I think they got out of the country when all the other planes were down. Um, there was also supposed to be like a very big pipeline that was supposed to be put in Afghanistan and that the, the government kind of fought back against. And so the United States kind of goes in under the pretense of 9-11 to get the terrorists. But the real job is to maintain the oil supply. Yeah. Um, 
And Iraq is very much the same thing. The other thing too is, is that it's also important to take politicians sometimes at face value and sort of believe what they say in the sense that they're telling you their motives sometimes. So the Bush administration did have motives with with the war in Iraq. The, the, the ones where we talk about like, you know, oil and economic resources and empire, that's all true. But the other component of it is the neoconservatives who were a sort of political force in the 90s and early 2000s through the Bush administration. These were people who were sort of uh, disillusioned liberals of the 50s and 60s who were fervently anti-communist. They weren't necessarily against sort of some of aspects of New Deal liberalism, but they were very much cold warriors. Well, when the, the, the Cold mm-hmm. War ended, they had to shift priorities. And this is where you get um, the, you know, you get Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations thesis, where um, mm-hmm. that the, the reason why we have such a problem in that region of the world is it's a cultural thing that like we're just so different than them and we have different priorities and and they don't than, than we do, which is I think nonsense. I think I most think people that's largely nonsense. I think that's nonsense. I think most people wanted their kids to have better lives than, than yeah. they had. And they want to have, you know, Safety, clean water, security, security comfort, comfort, <laughs> freedom. Like those yeah. are all things people, everybody likes. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the toppling of Iraq was, you know, was, uh, and the d- destruction of Iraq is one of the greatest crimes of the United States. And the fact that these people will never be held accountable for it, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the Cheney Bush junta, as Vidal calls it, will never be held accountable for the crimes that they did. Not just to those around the world in terms of the bombing campaigns, um, the torture campaign that we know existed um, at Abu Ghraib, as well as in Guantanamo Bay, the, but just also the, 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 the shredding of the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, uh, which, uh, I think Vidal's essay is called like, sh- you know, sh- you know, shredding the bill of rights, um, or something like that. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty disgusting what they did during that era. So part of it was, um, you know, part of it was they had, you know, mass telephone converse, like mass telephone surveillance that was unconstitutional, wasn't passed by Congress. They did it anyway. Um, uh, you know. Uh, before he sort of got canceled and, and kind of went to the right, Glenn Greenwald wrote a good book about this, you know, for, I think it's called With Liberty for Some. And he wrote about the sort of mass surveillance program that's done under the Bush administration. And, uh, and uh, it, it's pretty alarming when you learn that, that they just, they were, they were, you know, wiretapping phone calls of just regular citizens, just get a, just get a, a, a sense of who might be a terrorist today. And it's like, right. you know, most of the time, terrorists have some tells. It's not like you, you know, and I don't believe in like profiling or anything like that. But what I'm saying is like, you know, a lot of times you can pick up on like geopolitical problems in regions and you use your intelligence to kind of figure that out. But, you know, the, 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 the pre-9-11 American government was just sort of not ready for this. Um, you know, the United States was sort of taking a victory lap post-Cold War. You know, there yeah. was this very weird time sort of post-Cold War, pre-9-11 you know, I've, I've heard it referred to as the rendezvous from history. Yeah, the you know, 90s. The 90s. Like Austin yeah. Powers had a song at the end of one of his movies about how great the world was and how everything yeah. was so wonderful and everything was awesome. just improve. And like, yep. <laughs> and there was very much that belief, right? The, you know, the, the, yeah. the end of history, right? For sure. And the Bush That's administration. Nonsense. Yeah, it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> and the Bush administration shows us that, uh, that this is absolutely the case. Um and uh, yeah, and so I think that you know Bush was not an outlier in the sense that like whatever he was he was doing was like extraordinarily new. It wasn't. This we, these were trends that had started for decades and decades and decades. Yeah, and a lot of it goes back to the Truman era and the National Security Act of 1947, the creation of the National Security Council, um, and what was also known as. Um, uh, what was called NSC 68, which was a declassified document, pretty much laid out the Cold War vision of the United States, you know. Okay. So Vidal writes about this. He says, you know, this document known as NSC 68 for short and declassified only in 1975, committed and still fitfully commits us to the following program. First, never negotiate ever with Russia, which that sounds pretty familiar. 
Um, this could not last forever, but the obligatory bad faith of US-USSR meeting still serves the continuing plan. Second, develop the hydrogen bomb so that when the Russians finally develop an atomic bomb, we will still not have to deal with that enemy without which the national security state cannot exist. Third, rapidly build up conventional forces. Fourth, put through a large increase in taxes to pay for all of this. Fifth, mobilize the entire American society to fight this terrible specter of communism. Yeah, six, there's the propaganda campaign. Yes, this is the propaganda. Six, uh, six, set up a strong alliance system directed by the United States. This became NATO. Seventh, make the people of Russia our allies through propaganda and CIA daring do in this holy adventure. Hence, the justification for all sorts of secret services that are in no way respon responsible to the Congress that funds them, and so in violation of the old Constitution. So it's very clear. Like it's it's this is this is the world we live in now that has almost no checks and balances whatsoever. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that's important is noting that, in some respects, the Bush election of two thousand was, in many respects, a soft coup. Um, Republicans are right. interesting, you know, it's always projection with them. You know, they say that, you know, Joe Biden didn't win the election. Well, no, neither did George W. Bush and he still ended up being president. So what the fuck are you complaining about? Um, so in 2000, you know, George W. Bush didn't win the popular vote. Yeah. There was a very contentious recount in Florida. Um, and of course, like the head of the, you know, the campaign, you know, the, the, the state elections committee was that was one of the, the leaders of the Bush campaign. So it's like, you know, Catherine Harris. Um, and uh, and so there were shenanigans in 2000 when Bush was elected. It went to the Supreme Court. The right wing Supreme Court gave him the election, even though the popular vote clearly was won by Gore, especially in Florida. Yeah. Um, and basically what uh, what the Supreme Court did was stop the recount in Florida. Because the, uh, the Brooks Brothers riots, right? The Brooks Brothers riots, of which one Roger Stone was involved in, who is now like a Trump lackey or a Trump adjacent, at least. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so regular, regular guest of Alex Jones, regular yeah. guest of Alex Jones and Steve Bannon has a yeah. giant tattoo on his back of the face of Richard Nixon. You know, yeah. Real normal dude. Real um, normal dude. He looks like a cartoon villain. Um, but uh, but yeah, so. You know, the 2000 election was stolen. I mean, essentially, you know, the, the Republicans stole the election. Uh, and um, so, uh, sorry again. Yeah, we no. had a few comments. I just yeah, was let's break in. Through. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so uh, the most recent one is Velkin 999 said, didn't Bush send dudes to stop the count? Yeah, that's the, Brook, that's the Brooks Brothers the Brooks riot. Brothers yeah. riot. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was, you know, and so. What happens in the event of an electoral college like uh, like uh, problem? It then goes to the House of Representatives to decide who would be elected president. The House of Representatives could not figure out who should win the election of 2000. So they threw it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided in favor of Bush. Um, when we were talking about the 90s, uh, some random geek said, and this was around the time that the recording artist Cat, Cat Stevens was on a no-fly list because of his real name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, his name was Yusuf Islam. His name is Yusuf Islam. I think he's still alive. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right. And a lot of Americans were put on no-fly zones within any due process. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, some random geek said, we have to have an enemy. Otherwise, we have a, a standing army. Why have a standing army and build all these bombs we have? Exactly. Yeah, I, it's, it's very funny that you mentioned that. That's a very, very good point um, because – in that essay of his, The National Security State, he mentions how, um, you know, there, there's an official who talks to Truman. He's like, you have to justify this. We can't justify all this military buildup and the increase of taxes to the American public unless you scare the shit out of them. Yeah. And so that's what they proceeded to do. They scared the shit out of them. And that's what the Truman administration did with communism. And that's what the Bush administration did with terrorism, you know, and, and uh, you know, and so – and that's what, you know, the Israelis are doing right now with Hamas. It's the same thing, right? It, it's the scare the shit out of them, yeah. you know, and, you know, because, you know, in regards to Israel, like, uh, you know, the Israeli government got caught with its pants down with, in regards to Hamas. And that's the exact same thing that happened in the United States 20 years before. Yeah. It's almost like we never learn. Yeah. Um, some random geek uh, says, uh, and liberals just went along with the courts picking W for a president because 
quote unquote, it is the system. Yep. <laughs> How many times are they going to do that? How many times yeah. are they going to say, oh, we have to preserve the system. We have to maintain our institutions. And this gets to, I think, a real core insight of Vidal's, which is that he said in American politics that the liberals are the conservatives and the conservatives are the reactionaries. Yeah. And I think once you, so once you know that, American politics start to make a hell of a lot more sense. Yeah. Any more comments? I, I think that's it for now. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. So yeah, um, so we see a through line here and then we get into talking about, so 2000 was stolen. Vidal makes the argument in his final book of the three, Imperial America, he makes the argument that, well, maybe 2004 was stolen too. And, uh, and so you have, uh, Vidal goes on at length about um, the, what was called the Conyers Report. John Conyers was a congressman who um, published a report out of, uh, I think, one of the House committees or the, the, the Democrats on the House like Ways and Means or Oversight Committee or something like that, Elections Committee, um, saying that there was some funny business going on with voting machines in Ohio, um, which is probably true. Um, and part of that was the guy who was the Secretary of State of Ohio at the time was Ken Blackwell, who was the head of the Bush for Ohio campaign. Okay, interesting. So it's, it's, it's really weird, this like hanky-panky that goes on between elected officials who have to maintain like – like nonpartisanship and have, you know, clean elections. And you have like this, you know, fuckery going on where they're involved with the political campaigns that they're ostensibly trying to be, they're ostensibly trying to be above. Right. And, uh, and distanced from, um, and there's like a, there's like a meeting where Ken Blackwell's like with like Republicans and he says like, Oh yeah. And all these like new, these new voting machines in Ohio, they're going to make sure Bush wins the election. <laughs> It's like, they just say it, you know? <laughs> they just um, say the quiet part loud. And, and they just say the quiet part loud. So like, so, you know, uh, but liberals can't go with that. They can't, you know, this was heresy. So when like, when Vidal made these points, people thought he was mad. They, they were like, oh, oh he's yeah. gone crazy um, because he's saying this shit. And it's like, no, he's telling the truth and you can't handle that. Like, you know, he's being honest and he's showing clear evidence of what's going on here. And uh, it's nonsense. And, you know, and the thing about Vidal was that he was an historian. You know, he wrote a series of seven novels called, um, you know, Narratives of Empire about the history of the United States, going back to the founding of the country all up till past World War II. And okay. so he has a really great essay where he talks about, um, you know, that there are certain lies that sort of get perpetuated um, in, in history. One is that um, FDR... Uh, didn't know the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. Um, the second one is that uh, the second lie is that um, we had to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to win the war. And those are two really big sort of whoppers of American history. And, uh, and it lays out pretty clearly, he lays out pretty clearly with scholarship by, you know, Robert Stennett and others regarding FDR that um, it's very much, uh, there were a lot of, there were a lot of steps that the U S government took up to Pearl Harbor when they attacked Pearl Harbor, which started the second world war. Um, and so, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's very clear that within weeks there, there, the United States is making moves to piss J Japan off because right. the goal is to get Japan into the war. Because when FDR ran for an unprecedented third term in 1940, he said very clearly, you know, we will not go to war unless we are attacked. So then Very they clear. wanted to be attacked. <laughs> so they wanted to be attacked. So it wasn't so much that they orchestrated it, so much as it is that they orchestrated the conditions that pushed the Japanese to do it. Yeah. So he actually quotes, um, uh, I'm going to read a quote now from his essay, Japanese Intentions in the Second World War. So he says, on Saturday, November 15th, 1941, General Marshall, George Marshall, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, called in various Washington newspaper bureau chiefs, after swearing them to secrecy, he told them that we had broken Japan's naval codes and that war with Japan would start sometime during the first 10 days of December. Uh, on November 26th, Cordell Hall, FDR's Secretary of State, presented Japan's two special envoys to Washington with a 10-point proposal intended, as Hull, Hull told Secretary of War Stimson, to kick the whole thing over. Of FDR's ultimatum, Hull later remarked, we had no serious thought Jap Japan would, would accept – 
What was the proposal? Complete Japanese withdrawal from China and Indochina, Japan to support China's nationalist government, and to abandon the tripartite agreement with the Axis powers. FDR had dropped a shoe. Now he waited for the Japanese to drop the other. They did. So there's a lot of stuff that the the Roosevelt administration is doing to leading up to um, Pearl Harbor. So that, you know, within 10 days, Pearl Harbor happened on December 7th, 1941. So it was within 10 days. And so Japan attacks the United States. Germany declares war on the United States, which is kind of a weird, weird one. Other than the fact that the Japan, Japan had attacked them, Japan was allied with the Nazis. So, so they, was, yeah, they kind of was. A, They're obligated. <laughs> yeah. So it was. It was. Um, you know, and there, he also says, like quoting like Vidal again. He said privately more than once. He meaning FDR had said to others that that the um, the Japanese must strike the first blow, or as he put it to Admiral James O. Richardson on nineteen in October eighth, nineteen forty, as the war continued and the area of operations expanded, sooner or later they would make a mistake and we would enter the war. Hence, FDR's series of provocations culminating not in a Japanese mistake, but in the ultimatum of November twenty six that left the Japanese with no alternative but war preferably with a sneak knockout attack of the sort that had succeeded so well against Russia in 1904. So right there, it's, it's very clear that like there's a continuity within the American imperial state that sort of says, right. okay, we're going to let certain things happen because in letting, we're going to, we're going to make certain moves in order to push other things to happen. And in trying to push those other things to happening, we will get the, the intended result we want. Right. With FDR, the intended result was getting Japan to attack us so that the U.S. could finally get in the war because right. the majority of the American public up until Pearl Harbor were against getting involved in World War II because the American experience of World War I was so um, horrible. And, and, and the fact the United States got involved, it was such a bloody conflict. It was such a horrible conflict for the world. And yet – it it still led to the Nazis and it still led to fascism rising in Europe and it still led to a second world war. And the United States said, nope, let your, most Americans were like, nope, let, let Europe deal with it. Right. And, um, and so FDR was making all kinds of moves before the war to, to, you know, before getting in that would push, that would sort of set up what we would be doing. So the Lend-Lease program to England where we lent them, you know, naval ships and, you know, and, and uh, you know, where, we passed certain, you know, there were certain laws passed with Congress that sort of allowed us to to send sh- uh, ships to Britain, who had who had been continually attacked starting in you know, 39, 1940. So right away we see the the beginnings of the permanent war state, the the, the permanent imperial war state of America, and um, and I think that uh, the other really big lie was the that that we had to drop the, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to to end World War II. Right. That's also not true. Yeah. Um you know there were many generals including Dwight Eisenhower who had said, you know, we could probably get surrender from them in July. Like it can happen, right. you know. Um and so uh there's um there's uh, not just in the essay but I'm also reading the the American Prometheus reading the book about J Robert Oppenheimer who led the atomic bomb project he led the Manhattan project okay. that he had given guidance to the American government saying okay well if we now that we've got once the trinity test was done where they successfully tested the atomic bomb at Los Alamos um in the summer of 1945 um they alerted Truman and 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 president Truman was supposed to go to a Pots, the Potsdam conference with Stalin and Churchill to sort of carve out what post World War, post War Europe would look like. Right. And um, and uh, Oppenheimer had recommended to um, the American government that they need to be very clear that like, oh yeah, like we have the bomb, we've tested it. Stalin should know that they like because at the time the Soviet Union were still our allies. They were our allies in the war, you know, and the Soviet Union lost twenty seven million people in World War Two. Right. You know, without them, it's, you know, you know, the Nazis probably would have been victorious. And so without their sacrifices, that's that's the other big lie that like he because he has this this essay called Three Lies to Rule By. And one of the lies is that like, you you know, the the the, the, so the Americans won World War II. It's like, right. no, the, yeah. the Soviets did. Yeah. It's really the Soviets that won the war. And, and that's not to say that they didn't have American and like help 
or, you know, because we did lend money and supplies and stuff to the Soviet Union. Um, but, uh, but so, you know, there were, you know, so Oppenheimer had wanted to sort of have Truman give a formal, like, uh, a formal briefing to Stalin. That, yes, we have the bomb. We've right. tested it. It works. You know, we could end the war with this. Um, and Truman really doesn't do that. So Truman goes into Potsdam and instead of like being sort of honest and forthright and being like a good public leader, he decided to be kind of a, um, a sneaky asshole about it and decided to, um, to sort of be coy um, and sort of kind of let Stalin know, but sort of indirectly. Okay. Because what Truman wanted to do as the arch anti-communist was the, the, the real purpose of the bomb was not to end World War II. The real purpose of the bomb was – to show the Soviets what we could do and um, and to show our might against them, to show our possibility as a military power. It was to to um, to scare the Soviets into submission. That was really the goal. That didn't happen. And what ended up happening was decades and decades of nuclear armaments buildups between the Soviet Union and the United States, yeah. um, which are still active today. Um, in, in Russia and in the United States. And, and there now have been, any other country that might, yeah. you know, is <laughs> – this is all the United States' fault is the point. <laughs> Pretty much a lot of this is the United States' <laughs> fault, yes. Absolutely. And so when you get a sense of that and, – and also the other thing you get, you, get, you get a sense of when it comes to like the Bush administration too is, you know, um, a lot of these guys, uh, what they called them chicken shit hawks where – you know, like Bush, you know, he was in the Texas Air National Guard, sort right. of. That was kind of controversial about how involved he was in the Texas Air National Guard. Um, you know, Cheney was working in like government posts and in the Nixon White House during Vietnam. And when someone asked him, like, why didn't you enlist for service? And he said, well, it wasn't really a priority for me. <laughs> well, it's good to know that wasn't a priority for you. Yeah. It wasn't really a priority for the 55,000 Americans who died in Vietnam, not to mention the millions of Vietnamese yeah. who died too. Um, and yeah. so we see with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of civilians, you know, women, children, families, yeah. people who were innocent. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, and, uh, and we all did it to prove a point. It wasn't to end the war. And later on, when Oppenheimer met with Truman, he flat out said to Truman, he's like, I feel like I have blood on my hands. And, uh, and by multiple accounts, and this is in the Oppenheimer movie, if people have seen the Oppenheimer movie, you know, that, that, uh, once he gets out, um, you know, uh, Truman basically says, you know, blood in his hands, you know, the only person who has the person who has the most blood in his hands is me. And it ends with me, like never let that son of a bitch back in my office, um, called him like a crybaby in one account. Like Truman was an asshole. Like, yeah, I think like just cause you're a monster doesn't mean he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and there's and there's a ton there are like a ton of parallels between Truman and Bush where like Bush and Truman were both kind of simpletons in over their fucking head right um and uh and the world would be very different if FDR had been able to keep his vice president Henry Wallace instead of Truman Henry right. Wallace would not have dropped a bomb Henry Wallace would have probably put feelers out for peace between the United States and the Soviet Union like it would have been it would have been a very different world right um but Truman ended up being the, the vice presidential nominee in 44. That was the deal the Democrats had to make. The, the FDR team, FDR had to make with the Democratic Party in order to be on the ballot for a fourth time was they wanted somebody Southern in the role. So it's, again, American history, so much of us placating the fucking South. Yeah. So it was, you know, you know uh, we placated to a senator from Missouri. So Truman was kind of a simpleton and over his head. And in order to show that he was not in over his head or to show that like, oh, he's really up to the task of being president, he, he was sort of making these bold decisions and not really thinking much after the fact. And Bush did the same stuff. Um, Bush right. did the same thing. Um, and, and, and like Bush, Truman also kind of had his own Cheney. And that was that was Jimmy Burns. That was James Burns, who was his political, you know, um, uh, his political uh, – sort of a uh, strategist and was a designate to be secretary of state and all this. Like, so yeah, he kind of had his own genie too. This, um, it, it sort of reminds me of like, uh, uh, from the blowback podcast, there was like, uh, they talk about Bush 
and how he got he got where he was obsessed with the kill count over and over again so then like he would always be like well how many did we kill today how many people did we kill today or whatever like almost like proud of it like looking for like a, that's a score that the united states did yeah like, like yeah these these are monsters actually yeah these people really are pretty rough um and i don't think they actually really really give a shit um, I don't think most people in power actually give a shit about yeah. people. I don't think they care. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, yeah. Some, ran- some random geek said, you know, the bikini, the swimsuit, it's named after an island in the Pacific. If you look up the history of that island, the USA has done terrible, terrible things in the testing of nuclear weapons. Yes, that's right. And the whole mythology about Godzilla comes out of the bomb too. You know the, 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 that that Godzilla was sort of created as a as a as a um, a horrible side effect of the bomb. Mm. Sort of this this you know this incredible monster that cannot be contained. You know it's 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 interesting. I think that Godzilla is like a you know they're fun movies or whatever, but they're also a, like a like a commentary on nuclear weapons right. and, and the problems of of militarism and empire, um, not just for the United States, for but for Japan as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Wrong one. And uh, Velkin 999 said the inventor of the Vickers machine gun also felt bad that the, and that killed a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, Oppenheimer came out of the ethical culture tradition. Um, so he was Jewish by background, um, but he went to the ethical culture schools in New York. And um, so he was secular. Um, you know, we might today call him a secular humanist. Um and, but, you know, when he signed on to the, to, to do the Manhattan project, it was the idea of if we build the bomb before the Nazis do, we'll never have to drop it. Mm. That was kind of, that was kind of the, the impetus. And, um, but, you know, I think that in some ways, ways that, um, Oppenheimer was kind of a, a, a casualty of his own ambition and, uh, and yeah, so his, his story is as tragic as much as it is in some respects, like heroic or whatever. And then the movie Oppenheimer, I think deals with that very well, as does the book American Prometheus. And then another one from some random geek, some random geek. And yet many Americans don't question the fact that just one person has access to the nuclear codes. Just one person has the power to press the button. Yeah. And the person who's going to press that button for the foreseeable future will be in his eighties when their term ends or is currently in their eighties now. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. You know, people and people thought that Reagan was too old when he became president at 69. Right, eh? You know? Those um, same people are now like <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's just fine wild. with them. Yeah. It's it's absolutely wild. Um so to sort of sort of summarize, um, you know, Vidal was very much a countercultural figure, you know, in a lot of ways. He's very in some respects akin to Noam Chomsky and in fact Sometime in like 1990, 1991, he actually did a joint uh, discussion with Noam Chomsky. Um, and it's on YouTube. I highly recommend people check it out. It's great. Um, it's interesting to watch how Noam Chomsky thinks about things and the way Gore Vidal writes about things and thinks about things. Right. Chomsky is very like analytical and 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 sort of, uh, you know, kind of wonky, like kind of bookish and kind of nerdy. And Vidal is very like sort of lyrical and poetic and um, and uh, and sort of uh, 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 polemical and and I like that. Um, Vidal is closer to my style, but but mm. there's the, the substance is there. Is you know the, the criticism is you know we don't really have anybody in mainstream political life these days challenging American empire. No, not really. Hey, we don't. Everybody's been relegated to the fringes. Like everybody who like actually challenges power is like pushed off to the side. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the thing that's interesting is the partisanship in which this was in. So the anti-war movement, which was very large when I was younger during the Bush years, um, pretty much died when Obama became president and it has been dead ever since. Um, people are so worried about it when Trump has power, but it's like, we talked about this in the pregame, but like there isn't really a major fundamental distinction in foreign policy between the, between Biden and Trump. There really yeah. isn't. And, you know, maybe the only distinction you can make is that maybe the United oh. States would, wouldn't get involved in Ukraine. 
but but I still think maybe we would have. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Velkin nine 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 wanted to make a, a clarification that it was actually Mikhail Kalishnikov who regretted creating the AK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Oppenheimer felt that too. You know, it, it's it's um, you know it's why Alfred Nobel created the Peace Prize was because Alfred Nobel was the guy who invented dynamite. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. It was a way to sort of wash his hands of what he had done, right? But what is it that I can't remember if it's Hamlet or Macbeth. I think it's Macbeth where it's like the blood is on my hands and I can't get it off, you know, the out damn spot, right? It's that there's certain sins that you can't wash away that you have yeah. to live with. And America has many of those. And that was, I think, the point of what Vidal was trying to get across. He had a very romantic notion of what the future might be. And some of it is positive, but you know, his his basic idea was in order for the American Republic to be a true republic, a democratic republic, it had to stop being an empire. We had to stop having all of these military bases all around the world. We had to stop getting involved in multiple countries. We had to stop and start actually investing in our people. You know, there are Americans who every night in this country go to bed hungry. They go to bed homeless. They go to bed without adequate medical care. They are going through a crisis because no one supports them. You know, the United States is, is its, its cruelty to its citizens is a reflection of its cruelty to the world. And so when, when we see the amount of mass shootings that happen in the United States, I think it's a reflection of America's militarism and its violence. Um, I've said this before, but I, you know, and I know, I think Chomsky has said this too, but like the United States is the most violent nation on earth, period, like bar none. Um, and it will always be the most violent nation on earth because we've been the only country on earth to ever drop an atomic bomb on people. We became the most violent country on yeah. earth in 1945. And yeah. we've been that ever since. And it's been at the expense of our democracy. It's been at the expense of our human rights. It's been at the expense of our democratic liberties. It's been at the expense of decency and morality. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because Vidal wasn't like an explicit socialist, although I think based on his own politics, he would have been sort of a libertarian socialist, you know, a libertaire, as we've talked about. Right. Um, and But he was critical of power. And I think that's the big lesson to take from the episode tonight is to be critical of power and recognize that power is a force unto itself that can often absorb you and contort you to its purposes. Yeah. And that in order for America to really recognize its potential, to be a society that's worthy of, of, of its people, because I don't think that most of the American public actually wants any of this shit. Right. I really don't. I think most Americans, regardless of what political spectrum they're on, don't want us to be all around the world all the time, don't want us to put billions of dollars into other wars. And it's been absolutely disgusting to see in just a very short amount of time, liberals going from being, some of them being anti-war or even borderline anti-imperialist mm -hmm. to becoming some of those bloodthirsty agents of empire in yeah. my lifetime. It is, yeah. it is disgusting because – if that's how the liberals are going to be, good God, what are the conservatives like, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, the conservatives may not necessarily want to fight a war with Ru with Russia, but they sure as hell want to fight one with China, right? Yep. Yep. And the Democrats want to fight a war with everybody. Um, so they're kind of staying true to their roots, right? I mean, yep. you know, whether it's, you know, because every major war the United States has fought, with the exception of the Civil War, was was looked over by a fucking Democrat, Right. You know, yeah. uh, uh, World War One. that's Wilson, Democrat. World War II, Roosevelt, Democrat. Korea, you know, uh, Truman, Democrat. Vietnam, Johnson, Democrat. Like it's, it's you know, the Democrats right. are the war party. You know, wow, people think of the Republicans right? as being the war party, but they're really not. Like the Democrats are the war party, you know. Um, and so uh, you have a political system. You know, the United States has just signed off on a new uh, defense bill. It's the largest in right. history. Yeah. Well over eight hundred billion dollars a year. Jeez. We spend nearly a trillion dollars every year on defense. Absurd. And it's absurd. The vast majority of America's discretionary spending is for war. It's for yeah. it's for it's for defense. What they well, call defense. Yeah. While citizens literally suffer and like yeah go homeless and run out of food and 
Exactly. Yeah. And, and as a point of it all makes in one of his essays, he's like, don't count Social Security in that. Social Security is paid for with a separate tax and right. it's a separate trust fund. It should not be thought of as being a part of the federal budget. Yeah. So if you take that out, you know, Medicare and, and Medicaid and Social Security, you actually take that out because those are de dedicated taxes with dedicated funding sources like that. If you just table that and you look at what the American public actually, what the American government actually spends on, the vast majority of what the American government spends on is war. Yeah. And, uh, and at some point, I think we we're seeing the decline in American power. I think in my lifetime, we were seeing the decline of the American empire in, in real time. I mean, if you look at, you know, Iraq was a disastrous failure, which led to hundreds of thousands of civilians killed, thousands of American soldiers killed. Afghanistan was, was an apps, was, it was arguably even worse. You know, when, when the United States left Afghanistan in 2021, you know, just three years ago. Um, the Taliban gained back power in a matter of hours. It wasn't, you know, it was yeah. just like Vietnam yeah. in 1975, the last helicopters leaving Saigon. Um, you know, the United States has not fought a successful war since World War II, period. Yeah. And uh, and so the fact that any asshole who like writes for like Foreign Policy Magazine or the New York Times or whatever fucking defense industry rag you read – Oh, well, we got to do this. We have to be vigilant, vigilant about this. We have to do this war. And it's like, guys, have you ever thought that maybe the path to peace is the right one? You know, these people never, ever say, hey, maybe we shouldn't bomb that country. Hey, maybe we shouldn't invade. Hey, maybe we shouldn't give this country aid to, to, kill, their, to kill people. You know, it's never the solution for these people because they, they know where their bread is buttered. They know that their job is paid for by Boeing, by Northrop Grumman, by General Dynamics. Yep. They know. And so that, at the end of the day, war, it's that classic quote, you know, that uh, war is the health of the state. And it is very much. But it also war is the health of capital. Yep. It's good for capitalism. Yep. And so uh, I recommend people check out these books by Gore Vidal to get, give you a sense of who he is. Um, he's a great novelist. He may be an even better essayist. His essays are probably his most iconic stuff. And you get a really good sampling through the three books of, of his body nice. of work, um, who I, which I think is as timeless as ever. And, um, and I think that we need more people like Gore Vidal in the political, in, nominally on the mainstream. Yeah. Um, because there are things that he said in 2003 when he was criticizing the war in Iraq that would just not be allowed today. Um, yeah. And uh, I think Mehdi Hassan's recent firing – from MSNBC is a good example of that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we need to bring back a genuine sense of anti-war, anti-imperialism, um, and not just for the socialist left. I mean, we were always pretty consistent on that, but yeah. also for liberals. You know, liberals need to rediscover their anti-war feelings yeah. because okay. uh, watching you know uh, the the Biden heads just you know froth at the mouth for. You're making sure Netanyahu has all the forces he can to kill little kids. Just to murder innocent people. Yeah. Just to murder innocent people. The bloodiest conflict in the 21st century, bloodiest conflict in 21st century is the siege of Gaza. And the, the lessons that Vidal was trying to teach us in these books about Afghanistan, about Iraq, about Korea, about Vietnam, about the American empire, these are not being heeded. They're not being heeded. And so uh, I will bang the drum consistently for an anti-war, anti-imperialism, internationalist left that will combat this. And we are we have to be a part of that fight. Um, so, so yeah. So definitely check the books out, um, uh, I think. And you can also check out his like numerous interviews on YouTube. You want to get a sense of him. He's very fun cool. to listen to. He's very entertaining. Um, and, uh, and yeah. So uh, wow. I was just really excited to be able to talk about my – Favorite author here on the podcast. Right on. So I guess, what are we coming, covering next time? Next time, we are covering uh, – I legitimately forgot, actually. <laughs> Give me a second. I think we're covering um, – let's see. Let's see. What are we covering next time? Next time, we are covering a another small pamphlet, but I think an interesting one. Um, we're going to be uh, – this year, we're going to be doing some – Analysis of writings from the sort of libertarian socialist uh, left. And the book really? we're going to be doing next time is Marxism and Darwinism by Anton Panacek. Um, Panacek, the great sort of libertarian Marxist, council communist. Um, he wrote a really interesting pamphlet about the intersection between Darwin and Marx um, and sort of puts 
to bed some of the notions about Marx and social Darwinism and survival of fittest and all that nonsense yeah. um, and really defends Marx and Darwin in a, a pretty interesting pamphlet. So that's what we're going to do next time. Very cool. So I guess all that's left is where can people find you? People can find me at justinclark.org. That's the link right down there. You can also find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and TikTok at Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. Um, I got I don't really have any new writings out, um, but uh, yeah, just kind of check out check out the show. Um, you know, we've got some really interesting, we've been having some really fun clips of the show, interesting clips that have been going out. Corey's been working hard on. Um, and as always, if you like the content that we're making here, um, you like the work we're doing here, please consider becoming a patron um, at uh, Patreon. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, to the skeptical safety guy and street rat punk for becoming new patrons. I really appreciate that. Oh, I'm so excited that street rat punk became a patron. Thank you. You are so nice to me on social media. You've sent me so many nice comments. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being a patron. For sure. And thank you to everybody who was in the comments on, uh, on YouTube and Twitch. And uh, thank you to everybody for watching and listening. Thank you. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who share, supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to all my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of the patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a Patreon and want to contribute to that, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a sub stack where you sub can subscribe for free or you can donate once donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes that is on Patreon. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or five star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my so stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Uh, make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some pa posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. When Washington, D.C. was laid out, it was a part of Maryland and it was a part of, of Virginia. And it was a perfect square. It was a perfect square. Today, if you see it, it's, a, it's like a perfect point and then it's a little squiggly line. Like it's a weird shape now. Oh, yeah. And the reason that it's a weird shape is that the border was was um, reshaped during the Civil War. So the, the river that flows through Washington, D.C. is the Potomac. And so the border uh, between what was part of D.C. and what wasn't, the Virginia part of D.C., what was of D.C. that came from the territory of Virginia, the state of Virginia, went back to being a part of Virginia during the Confederacy and never stopped being a part of it. Interesting. So, so D.C. was originally set out as a perfect square, but today it's like a top square and then the, the Potomac is the bottom border. And the other part of D.C. or what, what D.C. was before 1861 is now just in Virginia. So Virginia has like a little section that's like used to be there. This used, used to be, to be this used to be D.C. proper and it's no longer yeah. D.C. proper. But the irony is, is that all of that is like Fairfax, Virginia, and it's like near. like And so it's basically a suburb of D.C. now. So it is ah. kind of D.C. even though it's not.